Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Community Platform. So returning fighters, criminalization or reintegration? What are the consequences for United Kingdom um, for, from, from people coming back from conflict regions? Do we put them in jail? Do we re de uh, desensitize them and rehabilitate them into communities? Should they be criminalized? Or should there be a program where, as I said, to not only desensitize them, but to integrate them within the community. The first case of his kind, Muhammad Naheen Ahmed and Yusuf Zubair Server, were given 12 years sentence on their return. <clears throat> the father, of course, has spoken out and said he would, he wish he hadn't contacted the security. Now, in certain countries, such as ours, we are arresting people, we're putting them in jail, we're giving them hefty sentence, and as I said, this is the first sentence. But in Denmark, a country that had produced more fighters than most Western countries, other than Belgium, of course, is taking a very softer approach by rolling out a program that seeks to reintegrate the fighters back into society when and if they return. I just wondered whether that is something that we can look at. Where, what are we going to do with all these people? Uh, do we leave them in countries like Turkey, where we know that there are a certain uh, number of people? Or do we say, let's come back, let's work with you. Let's find out, let's speak to two of our guests today. Assalamu alaikum, Wazir Bhai. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Welcome. Thank you for having me. And of course, Adnan Khan. Assalamu alaikum, Adnan. Wa alaikum salam. Wazir Bhai, just before the show, you were telling me that has been another arrest of a young lady. Yeah, there was an uh, arrest today, it was on the news, so anybody who's watching the news or listening to the radio would have heard that uh, <coughs> Runa Khan, uh, a lady in uh, Luton, I believe, I think she's in her 30s, mother of six Mashi. children. Uh, she's been arrested, charged and imprisoned for five years for terrorism, and the act of terrorism she committed was to post on Facebook a picture of a so-called suicide vest, mm -hmm. and to um, describe how somebody can enter into Syria through a safe passage. So she hasn't killed anybody, she hasn't got any weapons, she hasn't uh, broken any laws in this country, she hasn't, she hasn't got any intention to break any laws in this country, she hasn't got any intent to do any damage in this country, yet she has been arrested and put away for five years for terrorism. And you know that should uh, make a lot of people sit up and think that what's going on. Certainly not post anything on social media. Uh, that seems to be a very strong message that's been sent out. I just wonder sometimes whether these 12 years for the two, uh, two young men mm -hmm. and five years for this young lady, I wonder if that is a message that's been sent out and they're being you know, punished, uh, being made an example of. Well, the, I think that's no secret. Even, even the judge, when he passed sentence today for Runa Khan, he said, he goes, uh, the, the crime is very serious. Um, I don't know what he meant by that. Uh, posting on Facebook but he said it's a very serious charge it's a very serious crime and I have to send a message to other people who may do a similar thing so it's very clear they are scaremongering uh, amongst the Muslim community that you will not support the the rebel movement uh, against the tyrant of Bashar al-Assad in Syria and for that matter you will not support anybody that we don't agree with whether they're a tyrant or not so it's very clear that uh, Muslims are being now forced to accept uh, the British foreign policy as their benchmark for deciding where and where not to go and who and who not to help. So I think that's a, that's a very dangerous precedence. Quite, quite interesting but also quite frightening. Adnan, uh, not, be, uh, not a historian by any standards, but did we arrest people in this country when they went to fight in Spain? Or when you have um, people fighting in, you know, for Israel, for instance, the IDF? Do we arrest these people and uh, when they come back or when they came back? Bismillah I think you're not a historian by any stretch was a, was a deliberate ploy. You know that nobody was arrested. Rather, people were loaded for those actions. Um, a lot of people are still praised. You, you get profiles in the media of these, you know, these young, brave Jews giving up everything, all the comforts of life, going and defending that that illegitimate entity of, of Israel because it's part of their religious duty. Um, so it comes back to you know, the way in which not only we perceive things but try and uh, develop a perception, but also what uh, Maza said, you know, those we agree with, those whom we consider are in line with our uh, ideological views or those who are in line with our interests across the globe, 
yeah, you're, you're all, all okay to go and help them, work with them, fight with them, do whatever it is needed. But those we disagree with, will take a different stance to. And the, the inherent hypocrisy of that situation is, is lost on many people in that you don't even need to refer to the conflicts that you spoke of. You can look at this very same conflict. There are those who've gone and joined up with the Kurds mm. and helped them fight ISIS. They, they, they are being hailed as heroes from these countries with the sport, with the open knowledge. They, they've been given media profiles in, in papers, you know, had articles written on them on how, how they are conducting this alleged selfless act. So th there's no consistency, but, but that's to be expected. Even if you look at, even if you narrow that remit down to Muslims going and helping Muslims only, let's leave Israel, Jews going and helping Israel, um, or people fighting the Spanish Civil War. Let's look at just Muslims fighting f uh, uh, to, to help other Muslims who are being oppressed. As long as it's in line mm -hmm. with our foreign policy interests. Bosnia, thousands of Muslims went from this country. Thousands. Not with the government knowledge, but tacit support. And they came back, and they, they, didn't, they didn't so much have to, do, uh, uh, as have to do an interview at an airport. Thousands went to the Afghan jihad when we were fighting in the Cold War against Russia, because they were fighting the Russians. We had no issue with them. In fact, that's where the, you know, Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda sprung from, and we, we actually funded them. So if, if you want to speak in those terms, the hypocrisy doesn't even, it doesn't even need you to go to Jews going to Israel. It's Muslims <coughs> actually helping other Muslims is okay, so long as we're all right with it. That's right. Well, it's, it's, it's Sorry. not a principle stand at all. I mean, uh, Adnan is absolutely right. I was reading a uh, blog post not too long ago of uh, a very prominent uh, uh, personality in the Muslim community nationally, uh, well known throughout Britain. And he put on his blog post that in the early 90s, uh, when he returned from Afghanistan after doing a stint of jihad, um, he was stopped at customs and uh, they stopped him and they checked him and they were checking for drugs. So they said, look, can you take your hat off? because we want to unroll it and check for drugs. So he did that. And they said, oh, you know, you'd be surprised how many people bring drugs in through their hats. So he got the hat, put it back on. He goes, where have you been? He goes, just been in Afghanistan to do a bit of jihad. He goes, okay, have a nice day. <laughs> he told them, I've been to Afghanistan. I went for jihad. And the customs officer says to him, have a nice day. And he was on his way. No surveillance, no criminalization, no security risk. And it's, that should give a, a, an indication or an understanding today that it's purely, purely politically motivated. It's not a fact that these people are terrorists. It's not a case that Muslims are a danger to this society. It's because Britain views the current conflict as a danger to her national interest and something that may tip and change the balance of power in the Middle East with Bashar al-Ashad being kicked out. Doesn't matter how much they say that, oh, we want Bashar to be toppled and we support the rebels. The actions are, speak louder than words and anybody who is working against Bashar al-Assad seems, seems to find themselves on the wrong side of, law, of the law. Just like Adnan mentioned, this bikers gang has gone from Germany and Belgium and God knows where, Denmark. Mm -hmm. They're not being criminalized. Even mercenary fighters have gone from Britain to fight for the Kurds and they're being, you know, uh, profiled and talked about how, you know, great guys are like mercenary fighters. But suddenly if you fight for the civilian side of the conflict, because let's be honest, those people fighting Bashar al-Assad, it's not an army, it's the civilians who have risen up against the government. Yeah, but what they're saying, isn't it, that um, the people who are going, young people, they don't have any understanding, they could get hurt. And we found that, haven't we? Our young people have gone, and some of them are stranded in Turkey. They want to come back. It's, it's, that, that is... I, I cannot believe that that idea can be sold to anybody who has two brain cells which actually function. People who are prepared to give up life which is relatively comfortable in this country to go into a war zone because they feel other people are being oppressed and they're going there to help them. They know where they are going. They do not think it is mini paradise on earth. They know it's a war zone. So to say that people could get hurt there and to show this phony sort of, yeah, we care about them, that's why we don't want them to go out there, is, is, is a fallacy that I'm not prepared to buy. It's a ridiculous notion. The truth is that Bashar al-Assad has become an untenable ally. He cannot stay in power because of the fact that there's been such a mass uprising against him. But his removal has to be managed. Those who come into power, who come in to replace him, have to be equally or even worse, you know, at 
uh, to their own people and equally loyal to the West. But, no, no, you That's the reality that needs to be played out. That is the West policy, including Britain's. And all of these other issues, they are just, they're just there to try and build a case for this great life. A 16-year-old girl, two 16-year-old sisters went from Manchester. Right. Correct? Okay. What? Are you telling me that they were aware what was going on? This is, Surely. This is the problem with this discussion, right? When we start talking in terms of anomalies, we try and cloud people's judgment over the entire discussion. Why 16-year-olds are able to access passports and leave this country, maybe the parents should have a greater understanding of what is going on in their daughter's lives. But let's come back to that issue again. Even if we accept, and I don't necessarily accept it purely based upon that rhetoric, but let's just hypothetically accept that that is a scenario in which those two kids leaving this country is wrong. There are between 500 and 2,000 fighters from this country in that region right now. What's that? 0.01% or even less? No, it's a ridiculous way point. to try and paint the entire picture. The truth is the vast majority of people who've gone out there are men, okay, young men, men who are, and we're speaking about those who are actually involved in the conflict actively, who are fighting for a variety of forces fighting against Bashar al-Assad. Al-Assad has almost no sport. There are small factions across the Muslim world for their own political or sectarian you know, positions who may support him. Almost no support across the Muslim world. People who've gone there to fight him have not gone there because they are part of some global conspiracy or a plot. They have seen through our media or through, you know, social networking, etc., what is going on there. They have felt a connection to those who are being oppressed. So whilst you may get the odd anomalous case where you can try and say, well, you know, maybe these kids should not be allowed to go out there. It doesn't change the entire picture. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. But what you have, you've got some people stuck in a country like Turkey, and they want to come back. Right. The question is, when we do we ask them to come back and we do what we did with the two brothers 12 We've years, or do this. we put them through some sort of desensitization program? Some we've, sort of. We've already tried to address this broadly, but let, let's speak about that specifics. When we was when we opened the show, that is the exact discussion we were having, which is. Why are people stuck in Turkey not allowed to come back from this conflict, but almost every other conflict it was okay? The people that you should be blaming is not the young people who went out with, there with the sincerity, even if you disagree with their actions. You cannot question their sincerity. People who went out there with sincerity, those are not the people you should be criticizing. The people who've made it very difficult or nigh on impossible for them to return to Britain are the government the agencies, the, the, the people who make the policy and who run the policy. They're the ones you should be questioning. The people should not have any issue in coming back But we have a problem, here. don't we, now? We have a problem where we have got these kids or young people stuck in another country and they can't come back because they're frightened. So therefore, how do we address that? You and I cannot change that. The government has to and they're the ones you should be placing but the blame Why should the upon. government change? Because why, why would the government change? Why, why should the government not change? Let's look at it, for example. What is the, what is the broad remit of this discussion? Right? Either you prove positively that somebody has committed terrorist acts or prove positively that they are about to commit terrorist acts in this country or you try and say, well, actually what we're, what we're doing is certain people who have gone against what our foreign policy interests would be and who we deem may not necessarily hold views which we're okay with, we're going to criminalize them. Where's your ideas of freedom of speech and freedom of expression and all the other stuff which I don't believe to be true anyway but you try and run your society based upon them. You try and set up the entirety of the Western paradigm upon, you know, where these great liberals look at us, these oppressors across the world. This is, why, this is what people want. This is what people aspire to. And yet you cannot, you cannot stand somebody who disagrees with you upon the way in which the Muslim world should be treated by you or the Muslim world ought to treat itself. Those views are so difficult for you to manage that you will not even allow these people back into the country without criminalizing them and locking them up. So these may, are thought crimes. Yeah. No, no, I agree that maybe liberal democracies doesn't work out as it should. Maybe it doesn't. The fact is we have a problem now. We have a problem where hundreds of youngsters are stranded. We want them to come back, to come back to their families. They made a mistake. They made a mistake and they need to come back. They can't come back because they'll be arrested. How have they in Denmark, you have a program where they are not arrested. 
But I have a problem with the term you used at the top about reintegration. What does reintegration involve? Well, hopefully that they could go back into the community and be part not, of the community. That, that's not integration. What, the idea, the false idea that's being sold is that these people have views which cannot possibly, you know, coexist with the rest of the British society. Great hero of your country, Churchill, yeah? Um, was it 20s or 30s? One of the early members of a party that existed at the time of Keep Britain White, the forerunner to EDL and BNP. Have you ever heard him being mentioned as a far-right extremist? No. Because the problem here is, it's all about perceptions, the way in which you present things. You mentioned before the program started, Mandela. The, you know, the entire world falling over, tripping over their feet, trying to greet him and trying to hail him as a great statesman. That same world, at least those same powers, who called him a terrorist for the best part of his life whilst he was locked up. And if he was here today, he would be labelled as those a terrorist. So those people, I'm sorry, are not my criteria on how we judge people. It is unjust, it is wrong, it is unfair, it is deliberately devious calling these people anything other than normal citizens who went out there because they felt like there was a duty from the Muslim Ummah upon them and any impediment to them returning based upon the fallacy of they're going to come back and commit terrorist acts is a lie and that's a lie that the government and the powers need to correct. I don't know what solution you want me to present to that. The fact is Adnan that you and many like you will not change the government overnight. What do we do as the situation it is in reality? What do we do now? What we can't zap. Take a break for a minute. Reflect. Mazibai, what do we do with those people who are stuck and stranded? I think it's, it's, it's a difficult one because as citizens of a, of, of a state, there's not a lot you can do because this is in the realm of the government and people who have uh, authority to do something about it. It's not that we can <coughs> How do we influence there. the government to say that they mustn't be arrested? Because when it comes to one thing, I think Muslims, uh, Muslims are particularly naive on this issue and I think they really need to wake up that when it issues or relating to the uh, a country's foreign interests, uh, we have very little influence over the government. If you remember, if you cast your mind back to the Iraq war, if you remember Robin Cook, Mm -hmm. He was the uh, foreign secretary. Yes. Now you don't get much, uh, you don't get uh, a, a much higher profile role in the British government than the foreign secretary, other than the prime minister. He was dead against the war. He was dead against the war. He actually had to resign from the cabinet. Now, if he in the cabinet, at such a senior level, has got no influence over the decision making. What, what chance of... So what's the solution then? So what's well, the solution? The thing is, look, British, British government is always, always, and it's naive to think otherwise, is always going to do things which is in their interest. And remember, when we talk about British interest, again, the British people need to understand this. It's not British interest, it's British corporate interest. It's a difference. So the war in Iraq hasn't helped my life, or the non-Muslims, or the Hindus, or the Christians, or the atheists, or whoever in this country, the British citizens in this country, the war in Iraq, the war in Afghanistan, the, the arrest that they've done around the wall, uh, around the war, has not helped the lives of the common people in this country, but it has helped the balance sheet of some corporate companies. So when British soldiers are shipped off to faraway lands to fight, they're not dying for uh, liberty or whatever values they believe in. They're actually fi fighting to facilitate the interests of the corporate powers in Britain. And I think people need to understand that. So for us to speak against that is going to be difficult. Mm -hmm. we, the problem is we as a Muslim woman, are handicapped because we ourselves have no entity in the world which can represent our interests and speak up on our behalf. And that's where a cr the crux of the problem is. But coming back to the point Adnan was discussing earlier about what do we do with bringing people back. The thing is, as, as Adnan mentioned, people went to Bosnia and came back didn't cause any trouble. Sure. People went to Afghanistan, came back, didn't cause any problem. And people even went to places like Libya recently, mm. didn't cause any problem. The people that have gone overseas, Afghanistan, people that have gone overseas into the uh, arena of war and become radicalized and come back to this country and have committed crimes of violence or ex-serving British soldiers. Mm. One example is your Ryan McGee, yes. who was found with a bomb in his house. He was found with extremist literature. Uh, and subscribing to websites belonging to EDL and other right-wing extremist groups. Um, he even professed that I hate immigrants, I hate Muslims, I want to kill them, right? Far more than whatever uh, Runa Khan did, 
And uh, he, I, if I'm not mistaken, he wasn't even un charged under the terrorism law. He was charged for, for charged for possessing weapons he shouldn't have had. Mm. Right? There's been other cases. I think in Grimsby and Hull, the mosques were bombed. Mm -hmm. And they were done by ex-serving ser servicemen. Then you had right-wing extremists in the West Midland bombing the masajid there. You don't have that same sort of focus on the government... Uh, focus or even the cobra coming to meet about the the crimes committed by the right-wing extremists You don't have the government putting policies of reintegration of British soldiers coming back into this society And not only are they bombing mosques, they're coming home and beating their wives up How many marital disputes have occurred and how much violence has occurred in their homes? Uh, and I'm not blaming the British soldiers because they themselves are a victim of British foreign policy They have been taken from their country to a foreign country fighting in the war. They don't know what it's about. They've come back who knows what state their okay, minds So in. what do we do with those young people or not so young people stuck? What do we do with them now? See, see, this, is, this is the problem. The problem that, that I find with, with all due respect, with the, the discussion, is you're focusing on the solution because it's as if... Because we know what the problem is. No, but it's as if we don't know or as if we're deluded as to us being able to actually influence the government. Hey, if you're saying that me or you are, or mother or any other you know, individual of the street can genuinely change the positions of the government that it has taken on foreign policy bases because you know, we vocally stand together. That's naive. Okay, well then that, that is the, question that, that is the I'm problem with your... How do we as people on the ground, that how is, do we well, think... Well then that is the problem with that question. We're trying to present solutions to a problem that can only be solved by a government and this is the issue with it. The government is taking a deliberately devious position on this. Robin Cook mentioned, Foreign Secretary, like, you know, you, you already mentioned, it, it's the most esteemed position mm -hmm. in the cabinet. But not just that. Let's look at the relevance to the actual issue. The Foreign Secretary is the person who gets briefings upon all foreign affairs on a daily, if not weekly basis, especially issues which are live issues, would be the person who is best in the know would know more than the Prime Minister about the state of Iraq and the situation and whether it was a good idea or a bad idea, actually would be the person who presents that advice to the Prime Minister. And he resigns over this issue. A million people march in London. Yes. Right? You, so there's no solution. So, so, okay. So what I'm saying is that at this moment, we'll have to sit back no, what and we're hope saying for the is, best. No, what we're saying is there's a continuous duty upon you and I and upon every Muslim Okay, let's to come speak. back. We're going to take a short break and then we'll come back. Don't go away. Join us back within the next few minutes. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to Community Platform. So what are the consequences for the Muslim communities who are feeling that Muslims are being put under a microscope? They have been under a microscope for far too long. Criminalization, or as Adnan has objected to the word, in reintegration. Mazabai, what are the consequences, what are the effects for the Muslim communities? Are we going to be um, is this creating schism between the, uh, the, the establishment, the government, and the Muslim community? I think if you, if you remember, um, <clears throat> a short while ago, the, the government appealed to the Muslim women to uh, stop their brothers, husbands, sons from going to Syria, and if they've gone, to speak to the police. And this is exactly what the mother of those two boys did uh, mm -hmm. in um, uh, Birmingham or where, wherever it was. And now what's she saying? She goes, I regret doing that. Mm -hmm. And she feels that she's been betrayed. And the effect of this particular policy is not that it's bringing the Muslim community closer to the British government position. It's not that it's making the Muslim community sympathetic towards what the British government view is. It's actually having the opposite effect. And I, being cynical, I would actually guess that that's exactly what they want to do. I Why would they want that? 
it's, it's, when you've got problems in a society, it's nice to have a scapegoat and to demonize somebody and deflect some of the fa attention from the failing of the government. I mean, if you've had now something like almost 20 years of anti-terror legislation and you're saying it's a bigger problem today than it's ever been, it means every single policy that you have put in place has failed. since 9-11 has fantastically failed. Has fantastically failed that it's had no effect and people are still going over to other places. So this is a major... Uh, uh, damning indictment, if you want to say, on the government's approach to this whole issue. So what's happening to all that community cohesion then? I, I think it's just decoration, to be quite honest. It's, it's just decoration. It's not having any kind of real effect. I mean, the Muslim community, and it's not that it's radical groups. I think the mainstream Muslim position on many of these issues has now converged. So regardless of whether you're from what they may term as an extremist group or a mainstream group or a, or a modernist Muslim, I think you'll find that a lot of people are against British involvement in Iraq and Afghanistan. A lot of Muslims are against their treatment of Muslim youth through their terror legislation. And a lot of Muslims are against their approach on all these matters. So they've actually brought the Muslim community together in a way that the Muslim community wasn't together at, say, 9-11 at that point. So but, it's backfired? Well, from their point of view, yes. It's not achieved what they claimed they wanted to achieve. But whether they've herded all the Muslims into one, one, one pen to say, look, they're all troublemakers, they're all extremists, it's something wrong with their religion, let's get shut of all of them. Maybe that's what they're trying to, that's what they're trying to do. Yeah, but reverse the psychology, has that not actually caused for Muslims to come together? It, it, uh, it happens more often than not in, in travesty, um, that those you feel you have a, a connection to against an external threat, you naturally end up you know, uh, being magnetically attracted towards uh, those positions. Um, but that's dangerous. Mm -hmm. and it's dangerous because it's, it's a slight misunderstanding of global geopolitics. If Britain was, and this is not to, you know, denigrate any other nation. Actually, what I'll do is I'll not mention any of the names, but if Britain was a small country that was an irrelevance mm -hmm. upon the global political scene or stage, it is more and more irrelevant, more irrelevant than it thinks it is. But if it was one of those countries, you know, in, in some hidden corner, and it's carrying out a lot of these policies and legislation, you could try and focus the discussion upon, you know, this society and the causes and effects, etc., etc. But I think there is a, there's a global backdrop and context to this. Mm -hmm. um, that may be even bigger than you know, global, it, it may be a historical narrative. And that is the, the unwillingness. Islam has a track record of 1300 years of living uh, cohesively, peacefully, in harmony and in prosperity with all of the religions from you know, uh, uh, almost across the world simply because of how vast the Islamic reach was. The only people who've always had a problem with being able to accept Islam as an equal is those you know, who, who happen to be in power. They come from a Judeo-Christian tradition, but obviously they are extremely secular. And the only thing that still stands as a coherent, cohesive and almost live um, challenge to complete secular global domination, complete capitalist global domination, is the idea of Islam and those who want to establish the Islamic entity as a living, breathing thing. That is why Islam, in my opinion, needs to be continually demonized, continually reformed, you know, by those who many would argue are not even within Islam, you know, the, your Quilliams and your other borderline Muslims, who, who will try and push every boundary of this deen sure. to try and bring it in line with those secular, liberal, capitalist beliefs and values. That is why Islam, g generally speaking, finds itself under the microscope. Adnan, let's just take this call. Let's just take a very call. Assalamu alaikum, Brother Muhammad. Yes. Yeah. Right, well, I, I, I just like to, I just like to say um, I just like to ask the question: Why in the seventies there was over two hundred thousand Sikhs, and now there's less than two thousand? If you're telling me that Muslims have, have lived side by side with all the religions, 
This, there were 200,000 Sikhs where, and there are 2,000 where now. Hello? Hello? I, 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 sorry, I didn't quite understand your question. Where were there 200,000 Sikhs who are now... Uh, living in Afghanistan. Living in Afghanistan? Yes. And now there's less than 2,000. I, 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 think, I, think, I think there was millions of Muslims living there that don't live there anymore let, now because they've been killed me, or expelled. Let me, let me try and send no, the... No, you, 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 hang on a minute. You can't, you can't, that can't be an answer for, for, for let over 200,000. Let me try and answer your question, sir. What, one thing to clarify, the first thing to clarify is I, I was very specific with the figure that I used, which is 1,300 years, not the 1,400 and odd years since the, the advent of Islam. And the reason why I used the 1,300 year figure is because that is the time during which Muslims held a state and power, and that is the only time when you can affect people. So I'm not talking about these individual 57 nations who happen to be populated by Muslims. I'm talking about nations which were run by the Islamic ideology. That's the first thing. But coming back to Afghanistan specifically, Afghanistan yep. has been in the uh, depths and mires for the best part of 45 years of atrocious civil wars, Cold War arenas that international powers have used to try and play their own proxy wars, and Br Britain and America bombing it right now, uh, you know, for the past 10, 12 years, Taliban's control. It's, it's been through a lot of different phases of violence. So if people have left that nation, there are 2 million Afghans who are refugees in Pakistan. So I'm sorry, with all due respect, and I, I feel like, you know, the, the, the loss of life or the lo loss of livelihood of every individual is a sad situation but if you're going to concentrate on the few thousand Sikhs who've had to leave and not upon the millions who've lost their lives and have had to leave the country because of the war that isn't under nobody's control and hang, on, hang on a minute unless before it's mentioned any war there's no, there's, there's no war there's no actual war in Africa, in in um in Nigeria where Boko Haram are where they're killing uh, thousands and thousands of people daily and then you've got, you, you know, there's no war in Malaysia or Indonesia. These are all countries where, where Malaysia, Muslims, Malaysia, are like Malaysia. Where, like, where Muslims are causing trouble. Where Malaysia. Muslims are killing. Thank you very much. No, we are very grateful. I, I'd, I'd like to try and answer that. Malaysia and Indonesia have active foreign supported separatist struggles going on, which are mandated by the UN, the same UN which is impotent when it comes to giving the Kashmiris their right to live by their, by their own desires. So, of course, there are violent throwbacks there. You, you, the other one was Nigeria. Nigeria, if you want to dig up the, the, the tables as compiled by the, the not-so-neutral bodies across the world, Nigeria is consistently, consistently considered one of, the, well, the richest nation in Africa, but also one of the most corrupt places in the world. When you have corruption, it leads to people in poverty doing ridiculous things. If you want to look at Nigeria, have a look at the breakdown of Nigeria. The northern part is Muslim, the southern part is non-Muslim. I'll, I'll let you guess and I'll let you find out which part has the wealth and which part has the destitution, the poverty and all the ills and all the crimes. Thank Nigeria you, is not a fair society. Don't give me this that it doesn't have a war in the way that you want to define we've, war. I think we've, uh, we've lost Mr. Muhammad, but um, if, if you... Can, uh, can I just add a, a very short do, point? Maybe he's still watching. Uh, just, to, just, to, just to echo uh, Adnan's point. The point is, he said there used to be, what, 2,000 two, 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 or 2,000 two, and now yeah. there's 200. The point is there were 2,000 Sikhs there. Muslims ruled Afghanistan or in there for 1,300 years. So how come they never disappeared in that 1,300 year period? And suddenly in the last few years they've disappeared. It's not because what there was Muslim rule. It's what Adnan has said. It's because of the effects of colonial uh, imperial uh, okay. design. Let's on take another call. Just sorry, just, just let's before take, very quickly, he's gone now, but let's very uh, quickly take another call. Muhammad Iqbal from London. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, welcome, Assalamu alaikum. Gee. Gee, I've got two comments to make. Um, I'm going to take a bit of a devil's adequate approach, really. The first comment is this. Obviously, I agree with the meta-narrative these two brothers from Hebrew Spurs are saying in terms of geopolitics and so on and so forth. However, in terms of solutions, they will not provide you solutions because the ishtihad of Sheikh Tati Mabahani is not involved in political activism. Now, this is an ishtihad. That's fine. People are liable to follow this ishtihad. However, other ulama have done ishtihad that we should involve ourselves politically. Now, fine, you may not get many results, but sitting on your hands and just talking about the problem in itself is not a resolution to the problem unless you have a narrative for an Islamic state. So what I'm saying is this, as Muslims in the UK, what we can do is we can try to lobby our politicians. We should lobby our politicians. We should try to walk them out if we can do so. And this is political activism. People may not agree to that. Moreover, look, 
our youngsters are going to Syria, Pakistan, Syria, Afghanistan, and so on and so forth, fighting for ISIS, fighting against ISIS, whatever it may be. Most of these kids are not trained to do this. Understand, these p people are dying, they're going over there, they have jazba, they have emotion. But do they have, as these brothers will say, uh, you know, aqliyat of Islam? Do they have Islam intellectually speaking, or is it emotively speaking? So the fact is, at the end of the day, should we be sending over young kids emotively, and say, yeah, go fight, and so on and so forth. No, I don't think we should do that as a community. We should look for other solutions. Finance should be it, be it whatever it may be. So there are other solutions there if we try to dig the surface and go beyond the high horse of just saying, well, there's no solution really, or follow one particular ishtihad. That's the first point. And my second point in relation to the Islamic State, I'm a historian too. I've studied a bit of Oriental history, and I do know this, that the Islamic State was never a monolithic, cohesive state. We had from the beginning the Abbasid and the Umayyad states in Spain for 700 years. We lord about Spain. Oh, we had this technology and that technology. That was an Umayyad state, by the way, where there's a counter Abbasid state. We had Buyid Shia states. We had, you know, political disintegration. So we shouldn't have this notion of a utopic Islamic state Could that you will come and resolve all time, our please. problems. It will, alhamdulillah, because I'm a Muslim. However, we should know that this is a mundane world with mundane issues. If the brother would like to come back, let him come back. I'll hold on the line, inshallah. Thank you okay. so much. I'll, 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 but make it quick. I'll try and be brief because there are two quite broad points. The first one, I'm just going to, I'm not going to try and delve into the depths of, you know, the ijtihad and etc. Because the vast majority of people won't know what, you know, you're discussing. The broad thing that I find quite funny is <coughs> you refer to people being free to look at, you know, uh, other ijtihads of how to, uh, politically involve yourself to try and bring about change and yet then you go on to comment and criticize those who've actively taken their lives on the front line to try and bring about change it's a bit of an issue because you just said you're criticizing sitting on your hands and doing nothing and you're also criticizing picking up a gun and firing at those who are oppressing your brothers and sisters so it's, it's a little bit of a weird situation but the second one you started I, I suppose you've already given the position that I, I would have taken on this. You started by saying, I don't know much about history, but I've read a little bit of Orientalist history. Well, that's your answer. It's Orientalist history. Umayyads and Abbasids did not rule simultaneously. The Umayyads were overthrown by the Abbasids. You can you know, debate the mechanics of what's right and what's wrong, etc. But when you start saying that something is not a monolithic state, let me, let me comment upon the monolithic nature of that state, even if there were branches that had fallen off the tree. The Abbasids violently overthrew the Umayyads, but did not uh, seize control of Spain in doing so. The Umayyads controlled Spain and continued to do so for centuries afterwards. Interestingly, those same Umayyads who had been the Khulafa of this Ummah for the 90 years and who had been overthrown by these other people, accepted the legitimacy of those who had overthrown their forefathers and never declared a separate Khilafah. They declared an emirate over Spain. They were the Amirs of Spain. Okay. Never did they dare to say that they were the Khulafa of the Ummah because they knew the reality of that position, mm -hmm. even though these people had murdered their forefathers to take over their Khilafah. So, okay. uh, Orientalist history will is not Muhammad give you the truth. Okay, Adnan, is Mohammed Akbar still on the, uh, on the telephone? Hello? Hello, are you still there, sir? Yeah, I'm still on the line. Firstly, I am not saying that Jihad is not legitimate. Are you saying that the jihad that's taking place in Afghanistan, in Syria, is legitimate according to the fatahs of ish jihad? That's the first question. Go on, brother. Um, I, is it legitimate? Is I it jihad? Per, okay. Do they have, this uh, I personally, uh, based on my understanding of Islam, do not believe that that is the solution to the Ummah's problems. However, so we have to be very jihad. careful. We have to be very <laughs> careful in criticizing those people who go out there, like you said. Based on just by people who are prepared to go out there and put their money where their mouth is, as they say, put their lives on the line for those they feel are oppressed, even if you do not agree with the action. I said this at the top of the show, right? So even if you don't agree with the action, I still think that, that is a vastly preferable position to those Muslims who are prepared to sell out and try and buy their way through democracy. The, the same democracy that has never given anything to those who are Democrats for the past three, four hundred years. Muslims want to try and push Islam into democracy now. Okay. Okay, can I come back to that? Fine. So the brother says, from his understanding, he doesn't realize or he doesn't think that's wrong. But the point is this, I didn't say it's haram. I said I don't agree with that. And the fact is, I wait for the ishtihad of these individuals who are fighting in these countries. Where are the ulama who are given the ishtihad and their fatawas? If you don't know their fatawas, then the fact is they're following their own issue. In terms of the second point about history, by the way, I was being uh, ironic and rhetorical by saying oriental studies. I have studied many ulama. For you to say that there weren't uh, multiple political entities 
right? By the way, the Umayyads were never acknowledged by the Abbasids. Did you think uh, Harun al-Rashid said, well, the, Abbas, the Umayyads in Spain, the legitimate, you know, uh, were leaders and so on and so forth. No, what the, can I, no, uh, drama no, history, no, the Abbasids didn't accept them. Right, the Abbasids didn't accept time. them. I, I was only referring to the, the reality that existed within the Umayyads. But the point is this, the, the Umayyads, wasn't monolithic, it wasn't one Umayyads, Umayyads, empty, no, 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 <laughs> no, let me clarify, I already said, <laughs> even if branches had fallen off the tree, the Umayyads <laughs> in Spain, knew they had no right to be able to declare a Khilafah even though they were the Khulafah of the Ummah when the Abbasids overthrew them. The Abbasids right. didn't accept that accept a legitimate rule. I'm talking about the reality okay, of boys. there being so one united you, Muslim you, government. Listen, before I'm I go, sorry, can I'm I make a point? Before I go, can I make my final point? Fine, we acknowledge there was illegitimate Islamic rule and there was legitimate Islamic rule. That's my point. There are more nuances than this simplistic narrative that you're churning out, brother. Which, which you, Look, which you the started with. Day, we're all on the same page. We're all on the same page. Right? There is a difference of opinion in terms of ishtihad. Let's not make it simplistic because I'm not giving you simplistic comments. If you would like to sit down with me and discuss on the personal level, brother, we can discuss all the ishtihad in as much detail as in you sure would like. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, brother, can I just stop you right there? Open invitation to you. I know that you're a regular co contributor to Community Platform. Please come on to Community Platform and have that discussion. I'm sorry, because of shortage of time, I really have to cut you short. Jazakallah khair. Thank you so much. I'd just like to ask my two pence worth on that. Very just, quickly, just, because just we're in the moment. last five minutes. Uh, just because something happened in history, mm -hmm. whether you had the, 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 the Abbasi, uh, the Umayyad rule in Spain, and a different rule in Iraq and the rest of the Muslim world, just because it happened in history, it doesn't mean that Islam sanctions that. There's a lot of things happened in Islamic history. It doesn't mean Islam sanctions that. The fact that people are going around shooting people and blowing things up in, in New York and wherever, and they're blaming Muslim. People are saying history, oh, that happened in history, Muslims did it. Just because something happens and it's done by a Muslim doesn't make it Islamic. That Islam sanctioned three, three it. Of the first it has to be based on evidence. Three of the first Khulafah rights that were assassinated that's not the Islamic way just because it happened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I, as I said earlier, that we are not here to find a solution to the world problem. I think what we are looking at is a discussion is that we have young people who are stranded. They cannot be left there. They have to come back. What happens to them when they come back? Do we put them back into prison? You have 30 seconds each, both of you. No, days. of course we don't put them back into pr prison. But that's what's going to happen. Right, but see, this is the issue now then. I think they should be freely allowed to come back to this country, like is the precedent based upon other conflicts that people have traveled to to help those that they felt were oppressed, and they were allowed to come back to their lives as per normal. That's what should happen. I don't think that that is going to happen. So those who believe in democracy, like my brother who was on the phone, or yourself or whoever else, <laughs> should lobby your governments, the democratic government that you guys have elected, and tell them that this is the right path to do. Because I don't believe that that government cares what you think, and it is going to follow a certain foreign policy narrative, and it is going to demonize the Muslims because it fits a certain image that it wants to portray. Well, at least I'm pleased that you made it very clear that I believe in democracy. <laughs> Mother <laughs> Of course they shouldn't be arrested, uh, they shouldn't even be de-radicalized uh, de because number one, I don't think that there's anything wrong with them, to be, to, to be honest. And secondly, I think people need to be radical because mm. radical means thinking outside of the box, not accepting the terms and conditions which are there in front of you, which have failed and carry on failing. You need to be radical. Nelson Mandela was radical. All great leaders, all great people who bring change are radical. They think outside of the box. They do not accept the political paradigm which is put in front of them. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa did not accept the political paradigm in, in front of them. And the reason people are going off, and like we said, I, I don't think that's the way to change things. But why are kids, we should ask this question, why are kids going from UK mm -hmm. to Syria? They have been moved. And they feel that they don't have any Islamic government to do the work on their behalf. They feel that the British government cannot do the work on their behalf, so they feel that we have to do it. So the question is that if Muslims have used the political system here, have become more engaged, have been voting more and more in greater numbers, more Muslim councillors, more Muslim MPs, yet the, 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 the way they view Islam is worse today than it was 5, 10, 15, 30 years ago. The attacks on the Muslim country is worse than actually, actually it means that the integration and the Literally political seconds. participation has been a complete failure this from the point of view of Muslims. Thank you so much. Literally five seconds. I was only going to make reference to the conversation we were having earlier in the day, mm -hmm. which is, you know, we were speaking about whether changes, etc., you know, tweaks and gradual changes, etc. And I, I said something to you, then I'll repeat it. Revolutionary advancements in societies 
require people to take revolutionary <laughs> steps. They are not there. brought about by, you know, uh, five years, every five years we change the You're government. You're in my five seconds now, Adnan. Jazakallah khair for watching. But I think one word that has not come up in this discussion was injustice. When people feel that there's injustice, they will stand up. They will take action. Sometimes those actions are dire for themselves. I like to end with, uh, I think it was Martin Luther King Jr. who said that injustice, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And I think we have to speak up. We have to contribute. Jazakallah khair for watching. I'd like to share some information with you. Please do tune in next week for our guest is no other than Mozam Beg. Thank you for watching. Look after yourself and your neighbor. And I'd like to thank my two guests here. Thank you, Adnan. Thank you, Mazhar Pai. Until next week, look after yourself and your neighbor, whoever they may be. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum.